Welcome to Types of Microscopy. Uh, this is your host, Dr. V. Uh, we're going to go through and talk about the different types of microscopy that you might find in a microbiology lab or in a university setting. Uh, it's important to know what's available uh, to you. Uh, many hospitals do, in fact, have uh, higher types of microscopes that we're going to talk about. So uh, I think it's well worth your time. When we use the microscope, of course, we have to be concerned with the, uh, the, what we are able to do in terms of how small we can go. And we are living in the nano age down to the billionth. So that's 10 to the minus ninth, nano nine, Latin for nine. Uh, that, so the dimensions that uh, we can do now, believe it or not, is really close to the atomic scale. And that's what we're after. So uh, that's important to us. So various sizes that we need to be concerned about are usually in the millimeters or in the micrometers. Uh, protozoa and algae are pretty large as far as micro is concerned. The smallest bacteria measure around 200 nanometers, which is uh, pretty small. And the largest around, oh, 750 micrometers. Uh, most viruses measure between nanny, uh, 20 uh, nanometers, I call them the nanometers, uh, 400 nanometers, and some can be as big as 800 or 1500, but we still have to use a scope other than a, a light microscope uh, to be able to see those. So uh, that's you know, kind of what we're dealing with here. So really what uh, areas that we concerned is, is in this region here. Uh, really at the one micron to the 200 nanometer sort of in that range is the uh, the out the, the smallest we could do with a light microscope and then we uh, get into the range of electron microscope which we'll we'll go over uh, the light microscope uh, various aspects that we went over in the lab but uh, for our purposes here we have a binocular which has two eyepieces the binocular body uh, we have the arm, which uh, we carry with one hand uh, holding the arm and then underneath the base that we don't uh, drop it. We have the focusing uh, nose piece, and sometimes it's, it's referred to as a revolving nose piece, and it has usually three or four objectives. Ours will have four objectives. The stage, and we have the stage manipulators. This doesn't show that. Clips and uh, to hold the... Uh, the slide on the stage and then uh, things underneath the stage we find of course the course adjust and the fine adjust knobs the power is usually down uh, ours is a rheostat so it rolls like a uh, sort of like a rolling switch and then below we have features of condensers and uh, iris and diagrams and things uh, the diaphragm the iris diaphragm is pr pretty much like a uh, the old time uh, cameras were you, you, sh you get the f-stop by changing the iris size and those sorts of things. Usually we don't have to mess with uh, too much. The only thing I would check uh, with a condenser control knob is making sure that the condenser diaphragm, uh, the whole setup is below uh, about three quarters of an inch underneath the stage. That's usually a pretty good time uh, this is size there. So. And then uh, I think we're in good shape uh, as far as those. Please uh, learn the names of the various uh, pieces and parts. And here's just another diagram showing the same thing. And you can spend some time looking at it. But the names are the same, except you have the manipulators for the stage. They call it the stage adjustment. This is how we move the stage. Uh, we have the small adjustment and a larger adjustment. Stage will move. There's the clips. Uh, the hold the, the glass slide and it even has uh, some markings here that you can remember where your settings were uh, when you were working with a slide so if you had to leave you could pick up and you record those positions and you, you can uh, set your scope right back the way you had it now keeping in mind of course the magnification you can read the magnification right off of the objective lens and uh, this one happens to be the 40x uh, the ocular objectives that we have is 10x so the overall final uh, focus would be uh, uh, in this case uh, 400x that's your final or total magnification and now we need to report that because not all scopes are configured the same way these may have 
uh, 15x uh, for the oculars perhaps ours are 10 but there are some that do others and then maybe the magnifications are different uh, as a result of that uh, with the objective so it's good to report the final magnification and that way anyone that wants to reproduce your work will have uh, what they need to achieve with their scope okay so preparing the specimens uh, usually we'll talk about doing gram stains or other types of simple staining uh, we typically don't do much in the micro lab uh, for wet mounts and hanging drops although you could do it to look at what might be in water and that sort of thing but uh, uh, we don't particularly uh, worry about that the staining we use uh, various dyes now overall a stain uh, can be also called a vital stain or a vital dye and these are the ones that actually bind to the bacteria or whatever microorganism uh, that you happen to be staining uh, so uh, staining is a procedure and for various different types and you follow outlines that people have actually worked out that work well uh, basic dyes have a positive charge acidic dyes will have a negative charge and that affects what sorts of things of course these uh, dyes will stain to or stick to and so we uh, usually refer to uh, these uh, or the basic dyes uh, or positive types of charge uh, usually we can see uh, polysaccharides and uh, acidic dyes are usually what we use for the vital stains um, uh, that uh, are repelled by the cells and so uh, anyhow that's pretty straightforward uh, positive stain dye sticks to the specimen gives a color negative stain does not stick to the specimen but settles some distance from it so if you're looking at let's say a polysaccharide around a bacteria like a pneumococcus uh, then you would see the silhouette or this sort of area around it now we have those slides in the lab so you can see those uh, but I just want to make it uh, 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 available to you so a negative stain doesn't stick a positive stain does uh, we can use nigrosin or India ink for uh, negative type stains. Simple stains only require a simple dye. Uh, this could be Congo red. It could be various different types of uh, simple stains. Uh, the counter stain that we use in the gram stain could also be used. The uh, uh, various dyes associated with that particular stain. Differential stains like the gram stain use two different types: the primary and then the counter stain, and usually we want to differentiate because one binds to the other and doesn't to another type and so these sorts of things are useful and uh, we, we try to use those uh, uh, when we can to help us in our diagnosis of a particular microorganism to identify it and it's, and we'll do this in the lab many times so here's some simple stains here's crystal violet used for e coli methylene blue nothing substantial but it does uh, add some color and some depth to the microorganism normally they would be colorless and you, you, you contrast would be really poor uh, now the gram stain I've mentioned it was uh, developed 1884 he had no clue what he was actually doing with the stain other than he just tried all sorts of stains and so we use the gram stain today and it's a sequential of crystal violet which binds to a uh, pretty thick layer in gram positives uh, we didn't know uh, or he didn't know we know now but the the crystal violet will will bind the grams iodine is a mordant that means that it holds the crystal violet in for the gram positives the gram negatives there's nothing really for the crystal violet to bind to and so the crystal violet goes inside the the structure of that tchoic acids that uh, form in the outer wall and the grams iodine sort of blocks it so it doesn't leave when we do the alcohol rinse or the decolorizer and sometimes it's referred to as the acid alcohol but uh, the alcohol just tries to get rid of the crystal violet if you can uh, so in the ground negatives uh, it, it does the function for that saffron is the counter stain which is a simple stain I mentioned before but saffron uh, is sort of pinkish in color where the crystal violet is a violet or dark purple and so if the bacteria retains the violet the crystal violet then we know it's a gram positive and 
uh, if we use the alcohol and destains the crystal violet and we now counter stain with the saffron with the gram negative it will have the reddish color the saffron still binds the gram positive but you don't see it because of the masking of the dark color of the violet it's a pretty clever stain uh, but it is a differential stain and I just wanted to, to make sure that we, we got that so the differences in the cell wall structures are helpful if we know if the gram positive or gram negative then we can make a presumption uh, to go after a particular antibiotic let's say as a pre preemptive uh, strike while we're trying to identify so we'll use a broad spectrum type of antibiotic but you can see big differences here between the gram positives which are here and the gram negative we have a phospholipid bilayer that uh, we see in the gram negative the gram positive has this peptidoglycan with tcoic acids interspersed and that's where the crystal violet stains and uh, so this uh, as a result of this uh, will stain with the counter stain when we'll have the, the pinkish color where uh, the uh, gram positives the crystal violet will stick uh, to this uh, peptidoglycan sheet and uh, get caught in there with the uh, iodine as a mordant and then that's how we see a gram positive so that's pretty straightforward and you can see that illustration here the cell wall where we have a very thin peptidoglycan in the gram negatives but it's the phospholipid bilayer that really does the uh, trick as far as not binding to the crystal violet so and you can see a very starch, uh, staunch difference there's a gram positive gram negative and uh, I'll tell you gram did a great job with that so differential stains, uh, like the gram stain, there are others that we use. Um, in particular, uh, we use the acid fast. Sometimes the gram stain is uh, not doesn't really work well, and so we want to go after uh, using the counter stain or the carbofusion uh, with the acid fast uh, type of uh, staining. And uh, I'll show you how that works here in a second. But uh, they have a different uh, type of cell wall that. Uh, will hold tenaciously to that carbofusion and uh, will stick still after an alcohol decolorizer and so uh, this is what we see the acid fast negative the counter stain from the acid fast stain predominates which is that uh, purplish and the acid fast positive which is the carbofusion that's red and you can see the acid fast stain uh, here would be so it's sort of uh, opposite of the way the gram stain is so we're actually looking for the pink for a positive for the acid fast and that's what we're using usually for detecting uh, tuberculosis or something like that other stains that we can use that are differential are the endospore uh, you can see that uh, we see various forms that are coloring in, in these bigger larger areas usually represent uh, a spore uh, the, the typical dyes that, that I see most frequently is that you'll see the, the clearing zone at one end very clearly a spore. This is the Clostridia type of bacteria and spore formers are highly resistant and that's why they're problematic. Uh, uh, the old mummy's tombs and it's the revenge of, no it's not, it's spores usually in the wrappings and you breathe them in and you can get into trouble with various things that cl uh, Clostridia species are known for. So the differential stains, again, help us to distinguish between gram positives or gram negatives, or the acid fast, if it's a tuberculosis, or the endospores. And so we have a nice collection of those differential type stains. We can also use uh, just a straightforward uh, differential stain, uh, the gram stain, uh, and uh, out of blood so we could just do a blood smear on the slide do the gram staining the cells will stick and uh, unfortunately this patient has uh, staph aureus uh, in the blood which is not a normal condition and that's not a good thing uh, we do have capsular staining as I mentioned the negative type staining with India ink or using the, the flagellar stain which is these little small uh, spinning type filaments bacteria use for locomotion we'll talk about that in class uh, they spin in one way or another uh, provided that they want to move forward or kind of tumble and move in other directions but the flagella is responsible for that and we have stains uh, for those type of things and you can see those here the Indian ink uh, has that clearing zone around the capsules so we know cryptococcus uh, neoformans has that uh, polysaccharide 
and Proteus vulgaris, which is really modal, it'll swarm a plate, but you can see why all these flagella all the way around the peritrichus type of arrangement. So on the regular light microscope, uh, as I mentioned, we have the power of the objective and the ocular, you multiply those, there's your total magnification of 100x. And so what we're doing is amplifying sort of a virtual image in, in, in these uh, two stages of lenses. And we, as a result, we win with the 400x or 1000x. If we add the oil to the oil immersion, we get the 1250x, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. So what I mean by the real image, of course, is what's on your slide. Then that is uh, sort of portrayed or projected uh, through a lens system. And the virtual image actually comes to your eye because it's been magnified uh, by the lens system. So that's what they mean by uh, that sort of arrangement. Uh, the resolution or the resolving power is the ability to distinguish between two points um, or that are distinct from one another. And so the resolving power of the human eye is about 2.2 uh, millimeters. The resolving power of a light microscope um, using the oil immersion lens is about 0.2 micron, which is a significant uh, improvement, about a 10 to the third um, better. A refractive index is a trick that we play with oil. And uh, this shows the refractive index differences that plays a trick on our eyes is the difference between the water and the air. So the uh, wavelength or the, eye, uh, the uh, rays of the sun or the light rays come in and they're actually bent as they get into the water and it gives us the appearance that the straw is offset. And uh, that's just due to the difference in the refractive index of air versus uh, the water. Uh, oil does actually a, a much better favor. Uh, the oil will bend the light inward to the light tube and will get more light. Now, the function of a light microscope, it's all about how much light we get into the, uh, the uh, body tube of a microscope. So oil does that trick. This plays the trick uh, with the, uh, the refractive index as, uh, versus air. Uh, air tends to bend things out, oil will bend them in, so that's to our benefit. And we get about 250x with our scopes using that little oil trick. And that little bit actually was what the original microscope could do in total was 250x. We use that 250x to pump out that final little bit of resolution. You can see that really makes a huge difference in our ability to view this. And we see this uh, again, if it's a little bit blurry, it looks like there's some sort of you're going to see this and this is uh, staff and uh, with oil boom man it pops and uh, that's what we want you to see and uh, again there's a difference between without and with oil so uh, please make sure that we use that um, we we do want to use the iris diaphragm we can adjust the contrast it's sort of like the final adjustment for that which is under the stage hopefully you won't need to but uh, different types of microscopy we're going to talk about outside of light microscopes. We have bright fields, phase contrast. We have this uh, uh, the image conversion type uh, that gives sort of a stenciling look. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to do, uh, this is a contrast, uh, still a, a type of contrast microscopy. Uh, there's the dark field and a polarized light. And there are other forms which we'll talk about as well. But the bright field, it's uh, mostly widely used is where light is transmitted through the specimen. So that's a sort of a positive what we refer to as a bright field, and we've already talked about that. Um, a dark field uh, can be adapted uh, from a light field uh, by adding a special disc called a stop to the condenser, and the resulting uh, image is, is striking. You can see the contrast uh, is illuminated around so uh, this is the dark field type and you want to look at internal structures this is the way to go it's really nice it's very uh, useful phase contrast type scopes literally take light and because you can see the notch now everyone's if you've gone into a 3d type theater you have a red lens and a green lens in one eye and you know that sort of thing and different color lenses what you're doing is you're filtering this ever so much of a difference in the frequency of light that comes in so the phase is just off a little bit and that's enough now to give you a 3d type of effect and you can see that here is just kind of lets things pop out a little bit 
and it's uh, an easy scope to use and if you need to uh, look at internal structures that might be the way to go and this is an epithelial cell oh, it's kind of hard to see it on a 2d type if you're actually looking at it under a scope it, it actually has a better 3d effect so again there's a nice picture of a phase contrast as compared to the two i just was mentioning and if you have cilia around uh, the dark field doesn't do it but the phase contrast will it's just enough to to have those types of organelles pop and that's what you want fluorescence is one of my favorites uh, fluorescence we use a special type of uh, fluorescent type of dye and what happens is that when you illuminate that with ultraviolet light it starts to vibrate and we have different types of fluorescent uh, fluorescing types of dyes you know red blue green various things and if we do it in, uh, in contrast to a black field, you can see it just is amazing. So we can have antibodies attached to a particular fluorescent stain or dye and then apply that. And so the antibody will stick to wherever it needs to, you know, that, that it, it um, is uh, raised against. And carrying with it is a little fluorescein type of uh, fluorescent stain and then use UV and boom uh, you can make some really positive differential diagnosis with that here's a simple scope that we used at the vet school uh, that had the, uh, the uh, post-processing and various things that we could do but uh, it's a very nice scope they, they tend to be a little expensive we're two three hundred thousand dollars and again what we're doing is taking advantage of that dye that under UV just like walking into those types of stores where they have black lights and and things just kind of pop out of your clothes in terms of white or whatever but in a, a micro uh, a biology type lab we can use it to differentiate between two different types of bacteria as you can see here or identify uh, a, a pathogen using uh, the types of um, fluorescent uh, tagged antibodies uh, another type is a confocal microscope and we have problems with looking at cell structures that the cells are too thick and we can use a laser beam of light or scan to various depths of the specimen to deliver um, the idea behind it is that we can use fluorescence and also see the structures if they're a little bit more dense so confocal uh, allows us to do that and you can see the image it's amazing we see the dna and this of course uh, is a very powerful um, tool to use uh, now we're going to switch gears and move away from different frequencies of light or UV or various things. We're going to move now to electrons. And, and now we're going to use an electron gun with uh, various different types of power. Uh, the first one we'll talk about scanning. Scanning is not as high powered as transmission, but it's amazing what we can do with it. So the SEM bombards the surface of some specimen it's been coated with some sort of metal and so wherever the metal sits uh, the electrons bounce off and then projects that image onto a screen that's that's reflective so you're actually kind of seeing the negative image as as bounced off with these electrons and so you can see this was post process uh, if you ever see scanning electron my microscopy output it's black and white or it's in grayscale and then now we have post-processing programs that can as assign a different color uh, to a grayscale and gives you that uh, that nice color look and so it's a very simple your specimens go in the center here it's usually vacuum uh, almost a perfect vacuum in, in a scanning it's not perfect totally but it's good, good enough and then the visualization part of the, of the what bombards the screen and so we can put a specimen there, usually live or not, and uh, we won't live very long. And then um, bombard it with the electrons, and you'll see the scanning as it uh, uh, takes the electrons. And of course, uh, wherever those molecules of, of metal are, it's going to hit. And then wherever the uh, the area is that it's going to um, uh, reflect, you you can see that uh, with the image on the screen. So here's a uh, we have a uh, 
uh, mosquito. And uh, if you put an imaginary uh, switch in your mind here, just a toggle, you know, a rotations type switch, it's got three settings. Let me click it to the next setting. That's all I'm going to do with a scanning electron microscope is just click it to the next setting. And you can see that I can zoom in. And I have one more setting, so uh, hold on to your hat. Boom. Now I'm, I'm really focused in uh, about the best I can do with this. And so you can see I can click click and come back out and then click click go back in now i have about uh, i don't know two three minutes that i can enjoy doing this before i fry it but uh, meanwhile I'm, I'm collecting all the photography and i'm getting what i need uh, out of that so here's the head of a fly you can see the detail it's just amazing uh what we miss because we can't see it but the the, uh, the electron microscopes so like the scanning can pick it up there's our friend the deer tick the inodes uh, type that carries a uh, Lyme disease and you can see the proboscis here with the little scalies that uh, allows the proboscis to go in but not out sort of like a, a fishing hook and that's where we get into trouble uh, and the tricks with using hot matches on their bellies and all that best just to put right across uh, where it's sticking in is a, a, some sort of tweezer uh, and clamp that off because we don't want it regurgitating nastiness into you and then yank it off and uh, uh, then go see a doctor uh, here is treponema pallidum that was uh, prepared and pushed through a filter onto a filter uh, that uh, paper that you could see under uh, the scanning and you can see this corkscrew type uh, of organism uh, this one causes syphilis and of course under certain types of uh, hydrothermal worms look at the detail I just it's just amazing uh, the forms of life and and what nature has uh, even at the nanoscale it's just incredible uh, now we'll shift gears again with transmission microscopes now IBM built up to a 5 million uh, electron volt uh, TEM. It didn't really do much better than the 3 million volt, uh, but they had to try. No one really knew. But with a, a, just know that we're using brute force to look at. This. It works in the same way as the scanning, uh, but the transmission blasts a huge amount of uh, the, the electrons. And it works the same way the electrons bounce off the sample which we prepare now the big difference between TEM and SEM is the amount of time it takes to prepare the sample under TEM it's it's quite a process now uh, it was developed in the 30s uh, the old Ruska uh, electron microscope the transmission scope uh, NC State actually had some of those I worked on one of the originals you would take a rubber mallet and hit um, various parts of the stage of the magnets are to align it. It sounds a little crude, but today we just use uh, magnets uh, that we apply voltage to to adjust the the light uh, the transmission of the electrons through the uh, path there, and then you can align it and get it through your sample right about here, which is held in a gold grid and uh, then the image uh, and cameras set up but this is in a perfect vacuum and that's one of the other things it's expensive you have to put it in ground floor and buildings so if you ever want to know where they are just go in the basement uh, they'll put them on the cement floor and uh, use that there and here's some pictures this is a Phillips I used one like this at the vet school uh, but you can see various different sets setups a Joel is a really nice one but they tend to be about a uh, million dollars and they can go, go on up uh, to four or five million dollars depending on um, how good of a uh, experience that you want and I mentioned prepping uh, the preparing of the sample is the hardest part so you use what they call a microtome it makes little slices and you float those slices and this is uh, sort of a diamond edge and that cuts your sample ever so thin about a hundred angstroms thick float that on water and if it has sort of a gold color to it then that's right about the right thickness and uh, then you put a f you take your grid and you pick up your sample underneath that and then put that on that's the actual sort of like the stage that we use on a light microscope but this is for electron and that little stage fits onto that it's a little um, grid uh, that we use for that and then you have about 30 seconds before your sample gets fried so uh, be prepared to spend many 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 hours did I mention many hours many hours 
and now uh, here you go though look what we can see you can actually see the the binding this is a virus and you can see the little attachments uh even under the scope it's other types of looking at structures and it's quite amazing uh this is a really an amazing uh photograph uh we were looking inside a plant cell um i told you that we cut with a diamond knife and you know if you have a good prep is you don't see any uh, cut marks or striations throughout as a result uh, introducing when you made the cut with a diamond knife so if there's no imperfections and that's a really nice and whoever did this uh, that's beautiful that is just amazing uh, here is the t6 phage uh, you would grow it and then push it through a filter and then uh, float that uh, on uh, in some uh, type of uh, uh, something that congeals really hard and then use a diamond knife and cut that and then flip that on a grid and there you go You'll see those viruses there and there's a bacteriophage done the same way uh, just make uh, You fix it in a, in a really tough type of material and then you slice it with a diamond knife and that's what you'll get So it's quite amazing. There's rabies virus and uh, 25,000 X it's uh, looks like uh, I don't know what it looks like, look, bullets or something like that. It's nasty. Now we'll move to the final one that I want to talk about is the atomic force micro, um, microscopy type. This was actually developed by IBM about nine years ago, right here in RTP. And using this type of scope, which costs about three, four million dollars at the time, this is the Skunk Works that produced such a wonderful device. And how it works is you have a cantilever that's attached to this little probe uh, sticky thing that sticks out and that's about one angstrom thick and you start dragging that over your sample now the laser comes down and hits that cantilever and if it's moving as it goes over the terrain whatever it catches that pitch and then that goes to the detection system and re represents the sample that you're uh, trying to look at and that allows you the resolution is now that point of that uh, that's attached to the cantilever so that's usually one angstrom thick so we can look at things at the atomic scale using this and there's a lot of software and algorithms that pick out uh, the features so let's look at some of the things that uh, this little tip can do uh, versus the, the uh, on the surface as we drag it across and um, oh by the way they're getting more affordable and we can actually get one if we wrote a grant or something in the stem center if we wanted to um, to get a small AFM. So this is what uh, one AFM might output looks like and you can see areas and uh, What we're supposedly looking at is what the chemists say that we actually see uh, when we use uh, uh, AFM so they didn't lie to us with the ring structures and representations. It's quite amazing to have that confirmation uh, Here all together, so it's quite quite good. So that wraps up uh, our tour through the microscope i hope that gives you uh the various you know types of microscopes and feel and how that uh, actually comes out with the data and everything and uh so i hope you enjoyed that and there may be some questions that uh, you can find on on blackboard that uh will ask you about this video uh, at the end here just to reinforce uh your understanding thank you have a great day